One morning in early June of 2011, in the Russian city of Kazan, a 49-year-old Russian woman named Fagiliu Mukametsanov woke up feeling nauseous. Fagiliu had recently had some health problems, and her doctors had told her that she really needed to take it easy, don't do anything that really stressed her out or made her mad, you know, basically just relax. And so, on that morning, this is exactly what Fagiliu decided to do. Instead of pushing through her nausea to go to work anyways that day, she decided she would call out from work and stay home and have some tea and try to just feel better. But a little while later, when Fagiliu was in the kitchen making tea, her husband, Fagili, he came in and asked her how she was doing. And she said, you know what? I actually feel worse. You know, my nausea has gotten worse. My chest hurts and I'm starting to sweat. I'm going to go lie down in the bedroom. But as Fagiliu walked across the kitchen to go lay down, her chest suddenly tightened tenfold and she collapsed to the ground unconscious. Fagili rushed over to her and tried to wake her up. And when he couldn't, he rushed to the phone and dialed 112, which is Russia's emergency line, and he called for an ambulance. And then when the ambulance arrived, Fagiliu was not breathing. And by the time they got her to the hospital, she was declared dead. She had died from a heart attack. Fajili, who had been married to Fagiliu, his wife, for almost 30 years, was absolutely heartbroken, but he and his wife's religion encouraged people to have funerals within 24 hours of a loved one passing away. And so despite the fact that Fajili was basically despondent from all his grief, he pretty much immediately began calling relatives and friends and making preparations for Fagiliu's funeral, which would take place the next day. The next morning, Fajili woke up and put on his best suit, and then he joined his and his wife's family and friends at the funeral home for Fagiliu's funeral. When Fajili walked inside of the funeral home, he saw there were all these wooden chairs facing forward towards the front of the room, and at the front of the room, up on a table, was his wife's coffin, which was open and surrounded by all the flowers that Fajili had barely been able to buy with the little bit of money that he and his wife had. Fajili slowly made his way down the middle of the room to his wife's coffin, and the other people that were there saw him coming and got out of the way in respect to, you know, the husband of the deceased. And so Fajili, he walks up and he looks down at his wife, who again, you know, it's open casket so he can see her, and he was struck by her appearance. She just did not look right. Now, Fajili did not have enough money to embalm his wife, which means to preserve a dead body and make it look like it's very lifelike. And so instead, the people who worked in this funeral home had just applied heavy makeup to Fagilia's face to try to make her appear more lifelike, but it really hadn't worked. To Fajili, it didn't even look like his wife. After all, Fagiliu never even wore makeup, and so to see her with heavy eyeliner and bright red lipstick was just totally bizarre. Behind Fajili was Fajili's family and Fagiliu's relatives all assembled in the first row and they were beginning their prayers for the dead. And so Fajili, he took a few more looks at his wife and then he stepped back and joined the first row. And so as Fajili was standing there holding his mother's and brother's hand, he closed his eyes and did his best to focus on the words of the prayer instead of on the grief he was feeling for his wife. And as he was doing that, his mother, who was on his right side, suddenly broke from the words of the prayer and let out this strange crying sound. And Fajili, he opened his eyes and looked over at his mother, expecting her to be collapsed on the ground from all the grief she was experiencing. But instead, he saw his mother was trembling and looking straight ahead. And so Fajili followed her gaze, and what he saw at the front of the room made Fajili want to faint. His wife, Fagiliu, was now sitting straight up in her coffin. She wasn't making a sound, but she was looking out at the crowd of people with her strange makeup on her face, just staring at them with wide eyes. And for a second, everybody in the funeral home noticed this and went totally quiet, and both Fagiliu and the mourners just stared at each other. And then Fagiliu began screaming, but at first it was like she couldn't make any sound, and it was this raspy, dry yell that was coming out of her mouth. But then it built and built until it was sort of like a bellow or a roar. And when this loud, deep, guttural sound began coming out of Fagiliu's mouth, the mourners in the room began screaming too. And suddenly it was absolute chaos inside of this building. 
as funeral workers rushed to call emergency services, not knowing what else to do, Fajili, who also had been screaming after seeing his wife arise from the dead, he kind of snapped out of it and ran to his wife and he embraced her. And when he did, Fagiliu went from screaming to silent. And she looked up at her husband with wide, scared eyes and began crying. And then she slumped forward into Fajili's arms. At this point, Fajili's family and Fagiliu's family saw what was happening and they kind of snapped out of it too and they rushed forward and they helped Fajili lift Fagiliu out of her coffin and they laid her down on the ground. And even though she wasn't moving, her eyes were open and she was looking up at her family just absolutely terrified with all her makeup running from her tears. And then 12 minutes later, when Fagiliu finally was rushed to the hospital, she was declared dead again. It would turn out that when Fagiliu collapsed on her kitchen floor, she really did have a heart attack, but it didn't kill her. She was just unconscious and her breathing was very shallow and she wasn't moving and nobody noticed. And so when Fagiliu kind of came to and woke up inside of her coffin at her funeral, she likely was okay, you know, all things considered, she was, you know, healthy enough to be alive, but when she looked around the room and saw she was at her own funeral and sitting in her coffin, the stress of that moment had given her another heart attack. And this one had been fatal. On October 15th, 2003, a newlywed couple named Tina and Gabe Watson arrived in Australia for their honeymoon. They were both 26 years old and lived in Alabama, and neither of them made very much money. Tina worked in the kids' department of a clothing store, and Gabe worked for his father at a packaging company. But Gabe's family had gifted this honeymoon trip to Australia to Gabe and Tina, and so the couple was so excited about it, and they had taken actually a whole year to plan this trip out. It was going to be the adventure of their lives. Once in Australia, the couple spent the first week in Sydney, which is one of the biggest cities in the country. They went on a river cruise, they visited the famous Sydney Opera House, and they went to see the koalas at the zoo, something Tina was very intent on doing because she loved animals. And then on October 21st, so six days into their big trip, the couple headed north to the city of Townsville, which is this beautiful beach town that's right near the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the world's largest and most famous coral reef system. This was going to be the real highlight of their trip. Gabe had grown up loving the water, and now as an adult, his passion was scuba diving. He was a trained rescue diver, and any chance he got back home in Alabama, he would go diving. As for Tina, scuba diving kind of scared her. She didn't like the idea of being underwater for extended periods of time and breathing in underwater. It just felt so foreign that she didn't like it. But she knew Gabe really wanted her to go scuba diving with him in Australia. And so 10 months earlier in January of 2003, Tina had begun taking scuba diving lessons. And then right before they headed out for this trip to Australia, Tina had gotten certified in scuba diving. So after arriving in Townsville, Gabe and Tina would spend the night in a hotel and then early the next morning, the couple would get up and make their way down to the dock where they would board a diving boat. This boat was going to take them out into the open water right over this famous shipwreck called the Yongola where lots of people scuba dive and this Yongola wreck is right near the Great Barrier Reef. So it's a truly amazing place to go scuba diving. When the couple actually was out on the open water, they looked around and just could not believe how stunning everything really was. The beach town at a distance was unbelievable and the water was perfectly clear blue where they could see thousands of fish shimmering and swimming all around them. Finally, the dive boat came to a stop over the area where the Yongola wreck was and Gabe and Tina began putting on their dive gear as did the other four tourists who were also on this diving trip. Now, Gabe and Tina were dive partners, which meant for this dive, they were instructed not to leave each other really at any point until they're back on the surface. But initially, once they and the other divers were put into the water, the entire group swam down together 100 feet to the bottom of the ocean where this shipwreck was. And at first, everything was going great. The swim down was easy. And then once they got down there, because the water was so clear and sunlight could reach them, they were able to look at each other and just really take in how spectacular this really was. 
But unfortunately, Gabe, he looked at his wrist at some point and noticed his dive computer, which tells you how much air you have left and what depth you're at, was malfunctioning. And so he signaled to Tina that he needed to go to the surface and get his computer fixed. And so he and Tina would swim away from the group back up to the surface. And then once on the surface, Gabe was able to talk to the dive leader on the boat and he was able to get his dive computer fixed. And then after only a couple of minutes of being back on the surface, Gabe and Tina went back under the water and began heading back down towards the rest of the group. And as Gabe and Tina approached the rest of the group, they saw they were all kind of swimming around in dive pairs around the Yungola wreck. And so Gabe and Tina, they got down there and they joined the queue and began as well moving as a pair around the wreck. Back up on the surface, the dive leader, who was up in the boat, was just kind of sitting there waiting for the divers to come back up, when all of a sudden he noticed there was this sudden eruption of air bubbles coming up to the surface. And so he peered over the side of the boat to see what was going on, and Gabe, who had only left the surface after fixing his dive computer maybe five minutes earlier, came bombing up out of the water. And when he did, the dive leader immediately noticed that Tina was not with him. And before the dive leader could even ask Gabe what was going on, Gabe, who was obviously very panicked, he ripped off his mask and he began trying to tell the dive leader that something was wrong with his wife, that she had sunk away from him and he couldn't get to her and he needed help. And so the dive leader immediately put on a scuba tank, he jumped in the water and swam down as fast as he could to the wreck down below. And when he got there, he immediately saw Tina by herself laying on the sand on the bottom of the ocean, just totally motionless on her back. And so the dive leader, he swam over to her, he scooped her up, and he brought her all the way back to the surface. And then once on the surface, he put Tina into the boat, and then the dive leader, he climbed inside and immediately began doing CPR on Tina. And for 45 minutes, the dive leader tried to do CPR, tried everything he could to save Tina, but unfortunately, it was not enough, and Tina passed away. An autopsy would later reveal that Tina had died from something called an air embolism, which is when an air bubble gets trapped in a blood vessel and blocks it. In scuba divers, this can happen from holding your breath for too long or trying to ascend too quickly. One theory about how this could have happened to Tina was based on what Gabe said happened when he and Tina went back down to the wreck after he got his dive computer fixed. He said they got down there, everything was fine, they were swimming around like the other dive pairs, taking pictures, when Tina started to panic, kind of randomly, and she reached out for Gabe, and Gabe said she knocked his oxygen mask off his face, and so Gabe was kind of starting to panic, and he got the mask back on, at which point Tina was kind of floating away from him, and so Gabe, not really knowing what to do, said he went to the surface to get help. And so in that time frame, perhaps Tina, you know, tried to rush to the surface on her own, giving herself the air embolism, or maybe in her panic, she had held her breath, giving herself the air embolism. But it wasn't long after Tina's death was ruled an accident and the case was closed that the other four people who were on that dive with Gabe and Tina began reaching out to Tina's family. These divers had seen something very strange happen right around the time Tina died and they felt like they had to tell someone. One of these four divers would tell Tina's family that as they were swimming around the wreck, they saw Gabe and Tina come back down after Gabe had fixed his dive computer. And pretty quickly after they reached the bottom, Gabe seemed to give Tina a hug, like a really strong bear hug. Now, there's no reason any diver would hug another diver underwater, certainly not that hard, unless it was some sort of rescue attempt. And this diver who witnessed this told Tina's family that this did not look like a rescue attempt. It looked like Gabe was trying to restrain Tina and Tina was trying to get away from Gabe. After a few moments of watching this, the same diver would see Gabe release Tina. And at that point, Tina would go limp and float to the bottom and Gabe would rush to the surface where he would tell the dive leader that he had this emergency with his wife. This new information led Australian authorities to charge Gabe with murder. They alleged that Gabe intentionally turned off Tina's air and then put her in that bear hug to make sure she couldn't turn it back on again. Gabe, however, has always denied this, saying his wife really just panicked and he was trying to help her but couldn't and then went to the surface. 
Gabe ultimately pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter in Australia and served 18 months in prison. Prosecutors in Alabama then also tried to charge Gabe with murder or something else in connection to Tina's death, but ultimately a judge dismissed the case. One final note about this story, which also happens to be the reason most people know about this story, is that two of the four divers who were down there with Gabe and Tina were taking underwater pictures at the time that Tina died. Here is a photo they developed from this trip, which clearly shows Tina in the background just moments after Gabe had released her and she sunk to the bottom and died. In July of 1848, a 25-year-old man named Phineas Gage got a job working construction on the Hudson River Railroad in New York. At this time in America, railroads were being laid all over the country, and so lots of workers like Phineas were needed to blast rock out of the way to lay down these railroad tracks. And as it happened, Phineas was an expert in explosives. He had learned how to set controlled blasts growing up on his family's farm in New Hampshire, and then later in his life, he had worked in a mine blasting through rock. And so in addition to just being the ideal railroad worker for this time in America, when Phineas actually started working in New York on this railroad, his co-workers immediately started looking up to him. Phineas was extremely smart and energetic. He was this incredible conversationalist. He was charismatic and funny and a natural leader. And so just two months into starting this new job, it was no surprise to anyone who knew Phineas or worked with Phineas that he was promoted to blasting form which meant Phineas would lead the explosives team. Phineas was so excited about this promotion that he went to a blacksmith and had a custom tamping iron made. A tamping iron is a long metal rod that's used to pack explosives. When railroad workers wanted to blast through, let's say, a big rock, they would start by drilling a deep but skinny hole in the rock, then they would pour blasting powder inside, then they'd put a fuse inside, and then using this tamping iron, they would push the blasting powder and the fuse deep into this hole inside of this rock or whatever it was they were blowing up. And then once it was packed, they would ignite it. Usually, tamping irons were sort of rough tools that looked like crowbars, but Phineas really wanted something special to commemorate this promotion. And so Phineas had the blacksmith make this perfectly straight, smooth, four foot long metal tamping iron. And on one end was a pointed side and on the other was a blunted side. And this rod, it weighed about 13 pounds and it was about an inch and a quarter in diameter. And Phineas loved this tamping iron. He brought it with him, not just to work, but basically anywhere he went. On September 3rd, 1848, so not long after Phineas's big promotion, Phineas and his explosives team were blasting through some rock that ran through a forest. And Phineas, he was right up front over the blasting site, helping them prep the explosive. His team had drilled that long, deep, skinny hole into the rock they were about to blow up, and then blasting powder was put inside, a fuse was put inside, and then Phineas took his tamping iron and began packing the powder and fuse deep into the rock. And the way he did this is he used the blunt end of his tamping iron to pack the explosives, which meant the pointed end was sticking out of the rock. And so as Phineas is doing this, someone behind him slipped on a rock. One of his men tripped or something. And so Phineas, with his hands kind of on his tamping iron, turned to the right to look and see what was going on. And when he did this, somehow his tamping iron that was inside of this skinny hole must have nudged against the inside of the rock, created a spark, and ignited the explosive inside of the rock, which meant the tamping iron was basically fired like a missile out of this hole into Phineas's head. It went in his cheek, up behind his left eye, up and out of his skull, and then shot 80 feet away, landing on the ground, covered in Phineas's blood and brains. This happened so quickly that for a second, after this thing has blown through Phineas's head, Phineas just stood there upright with his eyes wide, and then suddenly a geyser of blood began shooting 
bursting out of the top of his head, and then Phineas fell backwards onto the ground. When Phineas's body hit the ground, he began having a seizure, at which point his co-workers, who were still kind of shaken up from this sudden blast, they rushed over and tried to kind of position him in a way that he wouldn't hurt himself. But I mean, they're looking at him and he's literally missing half of his head. He's covered in blood. And they're thinking, you know, there's nothing we can do for him, but basically wait for him to die. And so all of Phineas's co-workers who adored Phineas just stood there very somber watching their boss die. But eventually Phineas stopped having a seizure and then he opened his eyes and he looked up at his crew and he sat up and he said, what happened? Now remember, half of his head has been blown out by a 13 pound, four foot long metal rod that has shot through his head. And his coworkers, when they heard how clearly he was speaking and how focused his eyes were, I mean, they couldn't believe it. How in the world is this guy alive, let alone having a coherent conversation with them? And so the coworkers told Phineas, please lie down, we'll get you help, lie down, relax. But Phineas, who still had blood also shooting out of his head, just kind of stood up casually and walked over to the railroad cart and signaled for his crew to take him back into town. And so the crew, they're looking over at Phineas, who now is literally head to toe, just red from blood, still bleeding, but less so. And he's just sitting on the railroad cart waiting for them. And so they walk over to him and they start the slow one mile journey into town on this railroad cart. And the whole time they're all kind of looking at Phineas, expecting him to die any second. But instead, Phineas is just kind of looking around with half of his head. And at some point he pulled out his log book and carefully wrote down what time they were leaving their work site to make sure his crew was accurately paid. And then finally they reached town and Phineas was still very much alive and looking around, acting like nothing had happened to him. And the co-workers helped him to his hotel and Phineas just sat outside on a chair in front of his hotel, just people watching while his crew went and got a doctor. A doctor soon arrived and he too was completely shocked at Phineas's appearance, but even more so was Phineas's eyes. He looked at the doctor and his eyes were totally focused, like he was all there, totally lucid, looking at the doctor, waiting for him to come over and help him out with his little injury. And when the doctor kind of timidly approached Phineas, Phineas very famously said as he sat on his chair, Doctor, here's business enough for you. Like everyone else, the doctor fully assumed that despite Phineas's miraculous recovery from this injury, that he would soon die from this horrific wound in his head. And so the doctor moved Phineas up into the hotel, put him in a bed, and then basically made him comfortable. Now, the doctor at this point was not trying to save Phineas. He felt like there was nothing he could do to save Phineas. At this point, it was like mercy. Let's make this as pain-free as possible for Phineas as he inevitably dies from this injury. But Phineas didn't die. He would break out of it and basically be okay again. However, his personality at first, after he came out of this state of delirium, was not really the same. No longer was he this funny, smart, charming, confident leader. Instead, he was this guy who seemed to have lost all of his inhibitions and was kind of childlike. He swore all the time. He would tell people he had these crazy plans he was going to go do, but he would never follow through with them. And he would tell his nieces and nephews these wild stories about himself that were obviously made up and not even close to reality. But overall, he was okay, even though you could see his brain pulsing underneath his skin on the side of his head that had been blown off. And within a couple of years of this injury, those changes to Phineas's personality kind of faded, and he really did become old Phineas. However, there was one unique quirk to Phineas post-injury that never went away. And that was Phineas's kind of unhealthy love for the tamping iron that had blown through his head. After his injury, Phineas kind of stopped making friends and any friends he did have, he really didn't try to keep those relationships up. He didn't get married, he didn't have kids. Instead, the tamping iron became sort of like his best friend. He took it everywhere with him, even posing at one point with the tamping iron the way you would expect a couple to pose for a photo. 12 years after his horrific injury, Phineas would develop seizures, likely from the injury, and then he would die with his beloved tamping rod right by his side.
His case changed neuroscience forever by showing that an injury to the brain could affect specific personality traits. Today, Phineas's skull and his tamping rod are on display at Harvard Medical School. In the 1960s, Alan Burkhart opened a riverfront restaurant in Beaumont, Texas. And for the next 50 plus years, his customers would eat burgers, drink beers, and on super hot days, they would jump off the pier into the river to cool down. But one day in June of 2015, while Alan was in his restaurant looking out the back window, he saw something strange in the river. When he went outside to get a better look, he noticed his customers who were eating outside had also noticed this strange thing, and now they were standing up and nervously watching it as it floated by. Alan immediately yelled out to everyone to not go swimming, obviously, based on what they were seeing, and then he went back inside and made a sign that said no swimming, and he posted it on the pier. A few weeks later, on July 2nd, a 28-year-old local man named Tommy Woodward and his girlfriend, Victoria LeBlanc, arrived at Alan's restaurant for a fun night out. After several hours of drinking and playing pool, Tommy and his girlfriend made their way over to the bar and had a seat, at which point Tommy began telling his girlfriend that he planned on going Going swimming in the river that night. The bartender overheard him and said, Tommy, you can't go swimming in the river anymore. But Tommy was a bit of a rule breaker and said he didn't care, he was going to go anyways. The bartender began pleading with him and even got other staff members of the restaurant to talk sense into Tommy that he should not get in the water. But eventually Tommy just stood up, he grabbed his girlfriend's hand, left the restaurant and began walking down towards the pier. The bartender at this point just kind of rolled her eyes and thought, I can't do anything to stop him. And so she went back to her bartending duties. When Tommy and Victoria got down to the pier, the black water was quiet and calm as Tommy took off his shirt and removed his valuables from his pockets. Right before Tommy was about to jump into the water, Victoria stopped him and said she thought she saw something moving underneath the pier. But Tommy just laughed and said he didn't care and jumped into the water and disappeared below the surface. Immediately, the water around Tommy seemed to erupt like a bomb had gone up underneath him. When Tommy came back up to the surface, he was screaming and trying to swim back to the pier, but before he could get there, something pulled him under the water. And then a few seconds later, Tommy came back up again, and this time Victoria could see the left side of his torso was bleeding profusely. And so she instinctively leapt into the water to try to save him. And Tommy, even though he knew he needed help, he said to her, get back on land, save yourself. And so she obliged. She climbed back onto the pier, and when she turned around, she caught a final glimpse of Tommy as he was pulled back under the water and this time he did not come back up again. The bartender had heard screaming and so ran down with a flashlight to the pier and when she got there Victoria was hysterical and she was yelling Tommy's name and looking out over the water and so the bartender at this point is reasonably certain she knows what happened to Tommy but if by some miracle he's still alive she wants to find him and so she raises her flashlight and she begins scanning the now totally calm black water and as she's scanning she finds him. He's floating face down way off in the middle of the river and as soon as the flashlight hits him something pulls his body under the water and he disappears from view. It was no secret that the river that ran next to Alan's restaurant was home to alligators but these alligators were small and they didn't bother anybody and so the locals really didn't have any issues swimming with them. In fact they had nicknamed two of the alligators that were seen the most often. They named them Cheeto and Marshmallow but on that day in June of 2015 when Alan and the other guests saw this thing out in the river, what they were seeing was a monster alligator, the likes of which they had never seen before in this river. It was at least 11 feet long and over 400 pounds, and that summer it decided to make the underside of Allen's Pier its home. And so that night when Tommy leapt into the water, it was this monster alligator's feeding time, and so Tommy became its dinner. About two hours after Tommy was attacked, what was left of him was recovered from the river. Tommy became the first alligator-related fatality in Texas in nearly 200 years. Just north of San Francisco, California, lies Lake Berryessa, which is a massive freshwater reserve that provides drinking water and hydroelectricity to hundreds of thousands of people. The lake is not a natural occurrence. A dam was built in the area in the 1950s, and after it was in place, the water that pooled above it became Lake Berryessa. During the dam's construction, the engineers realized the structure would not be enough to keep all the water in if the lake were to flood. To solve this problem, the engineers installed what's called a spillway in the middle of the lake. 
A spillway is like a huge drain. When the water levels in the lake are normal, none of the water will go into this drain. But when water levels reach a certain point, the water, instead of spilling over the side of the dam, will spill into this spillway, and it will travel 200 feet straight down the 78-foot wide pipe. And when it reaches the bottom, the pipe bends sharply to the right, and the water is shot out on the other side of the dam into a creek. On a summer day in 1997, 41-year-old graduate student Emily Schwelik was swimming in the recreational side of Lake Berryessa. That evening, before she got out of the water, she decided she wanted to have a closer look at the spillway, which at the time, because the water levels had risen high enough, water was pouring down into the spillway. So Emily turned around and began casually swimming away from the recreational area towards the center of the lake. At some point, she would have seen signs poking out of the water, and she would have seen them on land telling her to stay back. After passing those signs, she would have reached a long line of red caution buoys that were the last line of defense to try to keep people back from the spillway. But Emily went under those buoys and continued on towards this huge drain. Meanwhile, the other swimmers that had seen Emily take off towards the middle of the lake, they didn't think she would actually get close to the spillway. Nobody went close to the spillway, and so nobody tried to stop her. Around 6.10 p.m., Emily made it to right before the edge of the spillway. It would have been deafeningly loud as 360,000 gallons of water poured over the edge into the spillway every second. Emily most likely was trying to get right up to the edge and then grab that outer cement lip and kind of anchor herself and then lean over the edge and get a look down into the hole. But what ended up happening is as she got closer and closer to the edge, the current picked up so dramatically that it began pulling her down into the hole. And so by the time she's over the cement lip, she had already turned around realizing her mistake and was trying desperately to swim away from the spillway but it was too late. Her legs got whipped around and sucked down into the spillway and she managed to grab onto the lip, the outer lip of the spillway with her legs now in the spillway. Thousands and thousands of gallons of water are pouring down on her face and so she can't pull herself back up. So she's pinned inside the spillway. People on land noticed this happening to her, but they realized there was nothing they could do to help her. If they tried to go down there and pull her out, they would get sucked in too. And so they called the authorities who have the right equipment to pull her out. But by the time they got out there, it was too late. Emily had managed to hang on to that edge for 20 minutes, but finally the water overpowered her, she lost her grip, and she fell backwards down the 200 foot chute to her death. On August 6, 2018, a manager at a grocery store in Lancaster, California, which is a town about an hour north of Los Angeles, started getting complaints from his staff and from customers about a terrible smell coming from the front of the building. The manager, who had come in the back door that day and so hadn't smelled anything, began walking through the store towards the front in order to investigate. He only made it to the cash registers before he had to throw his arm over his mouth and his nose because the whole front half of the store reeked. The manager's first thought was that food must have somehow fallen somewhere out of view and it was rotting and that was causing the smell. But when he went past the cash registers and went out the front doors, the smell got exponentially worse and he noticed the smell was predominantly coming from this brown liquid on the ground that seemed to be leaking out of the base of one of the pillars that lined the front of the store. And so the manager thought, well, it can't be food that's causing the smell. It's gotta be a sewer pipe leak that's happened right underneath this pillar and it's seeping up through the cement and that's what's causing the smell. And so the manager went back inside the store and he called a plumber. And then a couple of hours later, the plumber showed up. The manager pointed at the brown liquid out on the front and explained what he thought was going on. And the plumber looked at it and then looked at the manager and said, there's no sewer pipe underneath here. So whatever that liquid is, it's coming from inside the pillar. And so the manager was stumped because this pillar and all the others in the front of the store were purely decorative. 
there's no reason anything would be leaking out from inside of them. There was nothing inside of them. And so the manager asked the plumber to pull off one of the bricks around the area where this liquid was coming from so they could see what was on the other side. And so the plumber got his crowbar and he began prying off one of the bricks. And then once it was loose enough, he pulled the brick away, revealing an opening into the pillar. And the two men got down and they looked inside and what they saw horrified them. And they immediately backed up and they called the police. Five days earlier, a 35 year old man named Ray Rivera was pulled over by Lancaster, California police on suspicion of driving a stolen vehicle. As soon as the officer got out of their cruiser and began approaching Ray's vehicle, Ray peeled off down the road, turned the corner and was gone. The officer immediately got back in their cruiser and took off after Ray, but he had gotten a huge jump start and he had fled into a highly populated and busy area where it would be relatively easy to blend in and disappear. The officer called for backup and before long, there were dozens of other cop cars in the area looking for Ray, but no one could find him. A little while later, the police heard over the radio that a car matching the description of the one Ray had been driving had just crashed into a local grocery store. And so the police head over to the grocery store and sure enough, there's Ray's white pickup truck crashed into the side of the building, but Ray is nowhere to be found. The police began asking witnesses at the store if they had seen the man driving the white pickup truck and a few said they had. They said after he crashed, he leapt out of the vehicle and he ran inside the grocery store and then went up a flight of stairs to the staff only area. The police went inside the grocery store and searched the staff only area and they searched the rest of the grocery store, but he wasn't there. And so they assumed at some point after going inside, he managed to slip back out again and had escaped on foot. And so the police, just as a precaution, stayed outside of this grocery store for several more hours in case if Ray was in there, they would catch him trying to leave. But after a couple of hours, he never did. And so they put out a warrant for his arrest and they left. Well, it would turn out Ray had run inside the grocery store, but he had never left. After running up to that staff only area, he found a crawl space and he hid inside of it for several hours until the police left. And then at some point that evening, he decided he wanted to find a better hiding spot. And so he made his way onto the roof. Now it's not entirely clear how he did that. Either the crawl space he was in directly connected to the roof, or he got out of the crawl space and then found his way onto the roof another way. But regardless, he found his way onto the roof. And when he got up there, he realized the roof was totally flat until you got to the very front edge of the building, the part that looked down into the parking lot. There on the roof was this small structure that was built up just on the front end of the roof that gave the impression from the parking lot looking up that this building was a lot bigger than it really was. On the back side of this phony structure was a door that was accessible from the roof. Ray saw this access door and ran over to it. He tried the handle and it was unlocked. And so he opened it up and he went inside. Now this attic like space that sat on the front of the building really didn't have that much of a purpose to it. However, it did provide access to the insides of all of the pillars that lined the front of the store. And so it's believed that Ray, as soon as he walked inside, saw these openings and believed one of them would be the perfect hiding place. And so he lowered himself feet first into one of these hollow chutes. He got his feet and his legs, his hips, and most of his torso into this tight nine inch by 17 inch space, but his shoulders were too broad. They would not fit into the pillar. And so he raised one arm over his head and he kept his other arm pinned by his side in order to make himself as narrow as possible. And this worked. Inch by inch, he began sliding deeper and deeper into this two story tall pillar until he was completely out of sight. But as soon as his shoulders had gone down into that pillar, he would have realized he had made a grave mistake. With one arm pinned above his head and the other pinned by his side, he would not have been able to pull himself back up out of this narrow space. He was stuck. And so he probably began squirming and trying to use his feet to try to get back up into the attic space. But all of that movement only made him slip farther and farther down into this pillar until his feet touched the ground at the absolute bottom. And so not only is he already in this totally compromised position that would have made it hard to breathe, he was also in such a narrow space that the walls of this pillar literally were crushing his chest, making it nearly impossible to get a full breath of air. And when he screamed out for help, nobody would have heard him because he was entombed inside of multiple layers of cement and brick. Also making an already horrible situation that much worse, Lancaster, California was experiencing a very significant heat wave that month. And so all day long, the sun would have been blazing down on the outside of that pillar, heating up the inside like an oven. 
Five days after Ray got trapped, the plumber removed that brick on the pillar, and he and the store manager bent down and looked, and they saw Ray's leg. The smelly brown liquid that had been coming out of the pillar that had alerted everyone to this in the first place was purge fluid, which is something that comes out of a decomposing body. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is and where you found it, so give us the timestamp, and if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section.